We'll actually start. Well, listen, what we're going to do is we're going to continue with uh, response to question seven. Uh, but we have a question comment from Dr. McClellan in the audience. I'm going to read it. And actually, it fits right into question number seven. So this is a good segue. Well, maybe a continuation is a better idea. So this is Dr. McClellan's uh, thought question. Dr. Ryan has raised an important issue, ozone as the indicator of photochemical oxidants. Could the panel address the issue of reconciling the controlled exposure studies, humans and animals, with ozone versus the epidemiological studies which measure ozone but other oxidants are present? Should the ozone effect signal be greater from the epidemiological studies? So that's kind of the question. So again, this really does go to the current question under consideration. So would you like me to read that again? Okay, I'm going to read this again. <laughs> Dr. Ryan has raised an important issue. Ozone is the indicator of photochemical oxidants. Could the panel address the issue of reconciling the controlled exposure studies with ozone versus the epidemiological studies which measure ozone but other oxidants are present? And then here's the question. Should the ozone effect signal be greater from the epidemiological studies? So thoughts from the panel on that? Well, we were just discussing that at the, at the break. Um, you, you know, in principle, I suppose if you had pure ozone in the chamber and you had um, the outdoor environment, which includes lots of other materials, it's not only the ozone and the other oxidant, oxidation products that come with it, um, you, you, you might you know, you might get a greater signal. I, I think it depends a lot on the chamber and the way the chamber setup is. Um, the, 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 uh, the response might be slightly greater, um, but I do think it's very dependent on, on the size of your chamber, on the, on the structure of the chamber, the walls, as we talked about a little bit before. But I don't have any uh, real uh, hard data to, uh, to answer the question. I, th I think the difference might be there, but it's probably pretty small. Okay. Other comments? Yes. Uh, on our animal studies, we went out of our way to make them totally artificial. Uh, we used stainless steel chambers, and someone would come in uh, four hours before the exposure and run ozone through them to passivate them, in other words, to prevent them <coughs> from reacting with the ozone. So we did everything to suppress anything other than ozone. So um, in retrospect, uh, that's not as realistic as uh, what, you, what you have in the environment. So our studies were ozone, pure ozone. So going, and, to the, yeah. so going to the question, should the ozone effect signal be greater from the epidemiological studies versus, I guess, the experimental animal work, for example? I, I don't know. Uh, in the discussion during the break, it was pointed out to me uh, that when ozone reacts, it'll produce something with less reactive energy. In other words, it flows downhill. So pure ozone should be more toxic than the products of ozone. So I don't know whether the answer to Dr. McClellan's question is yes or no. Well, let me just continue. It, it seems from what you're describing, Dr. Phelan, that the reactivity for the experimental animal work would be greater than the epidemiology study. So the con converse, and I'm just stating this for your thoughts, the question is should the ozone effect signal be greater from the epidemiological studies in order to effect the same comparable change to ozone in the experimental animal work? And I think the answer is yes, yeah. based on so, what you said. So if you were to measure 0.2 ppm ozone <clears throat> in our study, that's just 0.2 ppm ozone measured right next to the noses of the animals. Whereas in the environment, if you have 0.2 ppm ozone, you're going to have a lot of other chemicals present. Right. And um, so my guess is that when you measure 0.2 ppm in the environment, uh, that underestimates 
uh, the uh, total photochemical uh, toxicity. And so therefore, the epidemiology study is, is not as sensitive to just ozone, and it needs a greater signal. I think that's what the question's asking. Yeah, and, and that's what I, I don't know whether the answer is yes or no. Okay, does that clarify the yes. question, Dr. McClellan? Uh, well, it just I want to emphasize that the outdoor environment, that big reaction chamber outdoors, is very, very complex. Mm -hmm. right. And there are literally dozens of photochemical oxidants present in addition to the single one we've elected to measure, ozone. And I, I think many experimentalists fail mm -hmm. to appreciate Mother Nature's reaction chamber and the complexity of it out there in terms of all of the various hydrocarbons that are feeding into the interactions with what we also know is a whole complex series of nitrogen uh, compounds that are involved both in forming and degrading that ozone. That's the point I wanted yeah. to make. The late Tim Crocker said, would say, if he were here, uh, if you don't put a chicken in your chamber, it's not a very realistic simulation of what's out outdoors. <laughs> Okay, other comments from the panel on this particular, again, presumption, should the ozone effect signal be greater from the epidemiological studies? The presumption is yes. Any, I'm just making that presumption. Comments, yes, Dr. Ryan? Uh, I'm not sure which way the sign SIGN would, would go in this case. Uh, mm -hmm. If one were measuring uh, in an ambient environment uh, uh, 10 parts per billion of ozone, that would indicate you have 10 parts per billion of ozone and I'm, I'm going to pull a number out of my head, 10 parts per billion is something else. And that something else is probably be less reactive than ozone. It might be equivalent to 15 parts per billion of ozone. And again, all of these numbers are completely made up, uh, just, to, just to give you the idea. I don't know, with my simple mind, how, how that affects the epidemiology. Perhaps my colleague could, could espouse on that, but he's shaking his head, no, he couldn't either. Yeah, I so, don't I feel, know. so I feel a little bit better about my uh, <laughs> knowledge as well. I don't know how that affects the epidemiology. I just don't know. I just know it's a, it's a mismeasurement problem. Okay, other thoughts? Dr. Ito? Well, the, the, the only other piece I, I would say is we, we don't also know what those products are in, in the chamber. I mean, depending on what the surface is in, in the chamber, you'll have lots of different potential. I mean, mm -hmm. The stainless steel is put in place so you don't get those reaction products. In our chamber, the fellow who designed it had some wisdom and said, uh, we're not going to make a cha uh, stainless steel. We're going to use a surface area that you'd see in a conference room or in this case in a hospital, uh, hospital room. And so there were lots of, of breakdown. Now, Roger's correct. It's not going to be the same. I mean, it's, it's not the outdoor environment. The important point is, is the, the whole cascade of events involved in ozone out there. You, you have a very simplified ozone generator. Sure. Outdoors, that occurs as a result of interactions between hundreds of hydrocarbons and these various nitrogen compounds. So it's not so much the surfaces that's important, moisture is important. One really needs to go back and, you know, well, read okay. carefully the chapters in Seinfeld and Pandas and their their book on, on the chemistry of it. And I think okay. I just want to make the point. I think we oversimplify that when we get into some of these discussions. Thank you. I think the point's made, Doctor Utel. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that we oversimplify it. I mean, in the chamber, it's it's ozone. That's what you're what you're measuring. When you're outdoors, uh, depending on what what the contaminants are it's not strictly ozone and it's breakdown product there are lots of particles and you know uh, depending on where you are there may be s uh, sulfates in the air there, there are lots of other things um, so you're you know they're not directly comparable but in the in the chamber setting you have pretty good control of the ozone okay we have a clarifying question or comment from mr. Kanas uh, well, Will, do you, did you want to <clears throat> follow up on this? Because I'm going to kind of change gears. Okay, fine. Yes, sir. Just, there if were, you could do that by yourself, please. Will Aulis and API. Uh, there were a couple, there, you might recall that the Hackney Group had a mobile chamber right. that they would use both synthetic air and then they would use Los Angeles area air 
and compare the responses of their subjects between the synthetic and the actual atmosphere. And they found two surprising things. One was the synthetic air was more irritating than was the ambient air, and that at the same concentrations, which if I remember were about 160 parts per billion during their, their chamber <coughs> tests, the uh, FEV1 pulmonary functions were not statistically different. So th that was sort of a direct test of that chamber versus non-chamber. The other thing was th the synthetic air was, I think, was more uh, irritating because it was produced with sort of 1849 irradiation of, of sort of cleaned air as opposed to what I think the chambers now use uh, pure cylinder air and they radiate <coughs> cylinder air to get ozone and then they add that to whatever your chamber atmosphere. So that made a big change as well. Okay, comments from the, any of the panel members? No, good point. Hmm. Right? Mr. Kanas? Yes, great, thanks. Uh, we, uh, before we leave this, uh, the EPI panel and move on to the next one, I, uh, Tom Lorenzo and I were, were chatting during the, the coffee break and we we're trying to, you know, we, we've heard a lot about limitations and, and concerns with the, uh, with the studies that go into the, the EPI and there were a comment made about despite, despite flaws, sometimes strong signals can come through, but I didn't hear whether there was a belief that a strong signal existed here and there's an art of interpretation to all of this. Uh, that said, uh, we obviously have seen um, uh, KSAC come through with a particular viewpoint at, in interpreting the strength of the EPI studies. It will be useful to, to hear uh, from Dr. Goodman and then from others, you know, the, uh, you know, in light of the discussion we've had and concerns over the, uh, the, the, the studies, you know, what role should they play in the administrator's decision and specifically any comments on then, you know, KSAC's conclusions. That would help us, you know, as we're trying to sort this out for, uh, you know, the discussion tomorrow morning. Okay, so we'll start. Thank you for the question. Let's start with Dr. Goodman and we'll just cascade over this way. So I just want to be clear. You want to understand why they came to their conclusions and, and why we disagree. Is that sort of what you're? Yes. Okay. Um, I think that the major issue is we're all looking at the same studies. If you look at the integrated science assessment, it's what, a thousand pages? It's this huge document. Mm -hmm. And the, sorry, 1,200. And uh, um, there are many studies, they're tabulated, they're described in the text. But the, one of the major problems is, is there's this focus on, on positive findings. and null findings aren't given as much attention. So you, it's hard to really see and to pull out, are those positive findings indicative of causation? Or is it you know, a multiple comparison problem? Um, and then, I mean, just sort of some examples that come to mind. You know, EPA said, oh, there's one study that adjusted for upper respiratory tract infections and found it didn't impact results, so we don't think that's an issue. And then, you know, when we dot dove deeper, we found that actually certain studies that adjusted actually did find it made a difference. So what I think is it, it's the issue is, is that in the ISA, each study was not looked at in the same systematic way. In other words, EPA started with, here are all the factors we're going to consider. We're going to s consider exposure measurement error. For this particular outcome, we're going to consider the confounders of, of, say, pollen and upper respiratory infection. And for this health effect, we're going to consider these potential confounders. And that it was done in a systematic way. And we're going to look at what statistical model was used and is it appropriate. And kind of tabulate all the studies and say, from study to study, are you really seeing, I mean, of course you're going to find findings in every study with that many statistical analyses and models. A and that, you know, those populations being as large as they are, you're going to find statistical significance. It would be weird if you didn't. But it was not, there was no systematic way of saying, are the results consistent across studies with the same lags, with the same confounders um, accounted for? Um, because if you don't do that, then you are, you're going to see these associations. They're going to jump out at you. They're going to look like there's something there. Um, and I would say, too, another thing to keep in mind is that the, the ISA is focusing on new evidence since the last review. I think they mentioned some older studies, but really focus on the newer ones. And, and really the question is, it's not whether studies since, uh, what was the cutoff, 2008, I want to say, or whatever it was, 
whether just these studies show something, it's whether the state of the science shows something. And, and if you look in the proposed rule, the administrator, in terms of EPI, points to multi and single city EPI studies of respiratory hospital admissions and emergency department visits, multi city and multi continent studies of cardiovascular, respiratory, and mortality, um, long term EPI studies reporting respiratory effects and interactions between exercise or genetics and new onset asthma and symptoms in asthmatics, and then finally, uh, new evidence of risk factors that modified ozone risks like genetics or nutrition. Um, and I can, I have this in a table if you want me to get this to you. And so basically what, I mean the fact is, is those are the, I mean that has to be it. That has to be what's shifting. If, you, if you're changing your causal conclusion, you had evidence before, it has to be the new evidence that's shifting this. And if you go through study by study in a systematic way, we're finding results are not consistent study to study. Exposure measurement error wasn't taken into account. And I think, you know, George was mentioning, you know, perhaps if these studies had used some of his methods to say how does exposure measurement error, how could it impact results in their interpretation or, or other issues, I mean, if those things were taken into account, then you could really see, you, you could really address that uncertainty, but that uncertainty wasn't really addressed. So okay. did that answer your question, do you think? Okay, we're going to go let the rest of the panel answer the question. Okay. Any other? Go ahead, Dr. Utel. Yeah, I mean, you ask a great question, and I, I think um, the, the, the reality is, and I haven't looked at this ISA in, in great detail, I've, I've looked at others, I mean, they're trying to put together a weight of evidence that tells the story that, 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 that they want to convey, and so I think Dr. Goodman's point uh, about sort of emphasizing the positive findings and maybe not de-emphasizing, but not spending as much time looking at uh, things that are negative uh, and that contradict um, lead to a, a conclusion. I mean, there, there's, you, you can interpret, as we did yesterday, pulmonary function is uh, and, and FEV or, or FEC or FEV1 as you, as you choose in terms of saying, well, if we take a highly susceptible person and we reduce their lung function by X amount, that may have a profound effect. On the other hand, they really don't have the data to show that, but, but it gets extrapolated into those kinds of, of conclusions. And so, um, you know, you're trying to put the pieces together and you emphasize those those positive findings would be my explanation. And certainly, uh, years ago when I was involved, that it, it was a a concern that uh, you you know you I don't want to say you cherry pick, but you took the strengths of the um, of the positive findings and 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 emphasize that because I think honestly they feel that's their role um, in 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 doing that to protect the public health. Okay. Other comments from panel members on this question. Okay, a related question, go ahead. If I might, I just want to follow up on this a little bit. Um, I think you're talking right now about what EPA does in the proposed rule, and it is trying to get to the result that it wants to get to. Is the same problem replicated in CASEC's recommendations? This is the Science Advisory Council. How do they explain where they wind up in terms of their recommendation of a level between, say, 60 and 70? Do they account for these problems is there a basically I'm asking you to, to to tell me is there a contrary scientific view and if there is what is it and once you've explained that how do you rebut it the rebuttal may be everything that you've just offered us yesterday and today but what would their those KSAC scientists say in response right okay fair question we wanted to take the same order Dr. Goodman would you like to go first sure um, so I think that, I mean, well, first of all, KSAC is a, a committee of epidemiologists and air modelers and, and toxicologists, so you have a group. It's not like you have everyone on the KSAC committee has expertise in every field. And <coughs> certainly, KSAC members, you know, the epidemiologists have, have read the EPI studies, but it's not like they conduct their own analysis. What they do is they review EPA's analysis and say whether they think it's sufficient or not. So if EPA <coughs> is is highlighting positive effects over null ones, th that's what's being seen. So it's, it's kind of, it, it makes sense that, um, 
that they would come to similar conclusions because they're not sort of starting from scratch, and they they might not be I think seeing some of the, you know, some of those null findings or or some of the issues aren't being pointed out in a systematic way, um, and I also think that perhaps some of them. I mean, that, that we have major concerns on the impacts of, of confounding and exposure measurement error and multiple comparisons. And I think maybe other people conclude that those don't have as big an, as an impact as we think they do. So that could be another side. Okay, other mm -hmm. comments from? Yes. Uh, my Graham. experience on the subcommittee for particulate material with KSAC was that uh, there was a division of purpose in KSAC. There were those members of KSAC who felt their purpose was to support EPA in their dec decisions, their approach, and um, their conclusions. And then there was, there was probably one person on the committee who felt that their duty was to point out problems, that was me, uh, <laughs> with that approach. So I think, I think the committee was aligned philosophically, at, you know, 17 to 1 kind of thing. So I, I don't, so whether that's good or bad, I saw KSAC as largely uh, designed to support the agency and, and provide, um, I guess it would be a, approval of, of the process. I didn't, we didn't answer the 60 to 70, though. Th that comes from the controlled exposure studies. That's not from EPI. That, that's where those numbers came from. Okay. Other comments from panel members? Yes. Another question, Dr. Arbuckle. So <clears throat> if, if we had a third table up here with the KSAC scientists here talking to us, what would they be saying? Not, not as not as members of KSAC, but as individual people like yourselves. Uh, In other words, are you the good guys and we're not seeing the bad guys? <laughs> One of the things they would say is, yeah, you can pick this apart, you can show flaws, you can show illogical things, but when you step back and look at absolutely everything, the weight of the evidence favors what EPA does. Uh, that's the best I can do to represent them. And you're, not, you're nodding. And uh, I think that's what they would say on table three. Okay. Other comments? Dr. Lang? So KSAC members also have the opportunity to independently write down their opinions about things that are in the ISA or the HRA mm. or the different documents. And in the end, um, everything gets kind of distilled down to a letter that gets sent back to the EPA. But if you read the individual members' comments, many of them are the same as the comments that we've made today. So you, we see a lot of these same concerns in the in the KSAC's individual comments on the on those documents. Yeah, and I, I also I feel like it's an emperor's new clothes since we've already had Goldilocks and, <laughs> and Alice, in <laughs> Alice in Wonderland. So I'll bring in the emperor. No, but they have. Ozone, NOx, and PM now, KSAC members have these major discussions about exposure measurement and error and, and the implications of it. And then they go to talk about the epi, and it's like, it, it, poof, it goes away. And it doesn't make any sense. Where did that go? Where did that discussion go? So it's almost like they, they recognize the issues, but they're not seeing it through to the end. Dr. Lang, do we have uh, a very uh, set of summary comments from KSAC members that we can make available over the afternoon break? Let us. Yeah, they're on EPA's website. We could find them. Can we, we make could, those we could, available to us? We could find links for it, but you kind of have to dig to find it. The letters are easy to find. The, the KSAC comments are... The individual are, are, comments. The individual yeah. comments are, are kind of buried. It takes okay. some, some can, work to get there. Can we make those summaries available I'm to sure we us? can find them. I think we yeah. have them cataloged. So. Great. As long as they're not like 100 pages. If they're like 10 pages, that would be helpful, right? Uh, they, they may be 100 pages. But if you can at least skim to see, get a sense of what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. we can right. Dr. Yeah. Arbuckle, did that well, answer I'm your just, question? Uh, well, yeah. In other words, it's like every other human group where the individuals have to, in other words, it's a political process, small p. Okay. Well, and, 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 and generally, I, I think as someone said, that there are different members of the committee who have the expertise in different areas. And, and often, uh, they sort of drive 
the, the discussion in each of those areas. So you may get comments from other members who, who questioned or, or, or have concerns about some data, but that's not necessarily their primary expertise. And, and how the report gets put together, how the letter gets put together, uh, you know, is a, an integration of people largely with, with the expertise in different areas. Okay, we're gonna get off this question. We're on question seven still, and we've been talking about it. I'm just gonna read it one more time and give everybody a chance to talk about it one last time. Considering exposure measurement error, how do ambient air concentrations and epidemiology studies relate to personal exposures and impact the interpretation of results of these studies? We've had some really good commentary. We have this idea of strength of association from Dr. Phelan. You know, it, it appears to be tiny here, so the, causi the causality question is more mute. Um, you know, this we also have, I think, from Dr. Utel, perhaps Dr. Maldonado, that causality is not observed. Associations are not causal. Uh, never going. I'm blanking on my notes here. Okay, well, in any event, I'm not going to try to read notes. I can't read that my, I made myself. I'm glad we have note takers here. But the point is, any additional comments on this particular question that we want to put on the table before we move to the next presentation? Yes. Yeah, I, I think one thing that gets lost in the whole process <clears throat> is the fact that what we decide to do determines our exposure and is going to determine our responses. Do we decide to turn the compost over? and get uh, you know, half a gram of uh, inhalable material <clears throat> that day. And the thing that's concerning me about public health is this process, I think it tells the public that we as scientists and EPA will just protect them from all sorts of inhalation risks by setting standards. Mm -hmm. And in reality, the personal exposure overwhelmingly dominates what you're gonna be exposed to. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, I, I felt that the downside of these of stringent regula regulations was people as individuals think they're protected no matter what they do. And that's not the case. So the personal exposures are extremely important and there's the implication that they're not when we say this is a protective level. Okay. Any other last thoughts from the panel members? <clears throat> okay, we have one last quick question. Go ahead, sir. And then we're going to move on. Tim French with EMA. I was just wondering if anybody has tried to um, quantify the uncertainty that is associated with having centralized air monitors to measure ambient levels of ozone versus what individuals' personal exposures really are given the time they spend indoors, driving to and from work, whatever, and whether or not if you quantified that uncertainty, what, what that would do to the error bars around these findings of you know, significance. For example, if we assume that my personal exposure to ozone could be, let's call it, 70% less than an ambient <coughs> monitor's readings. You know, arguably, that's a, that's a swing of, I don't know, 30 ppb. And, and if we applied that type of delta to the exposure readings that are being assigned to people, I mean, am I missing something? It seems that that could be a really very large source of uncertainty. And given the statistical methods that you all have, which I don't pretend to understand, it seems you ought to be able to quantify that uncertainty and apply it to these findings and, and tell me whether or not that bound of uncertainty actually gobbles up the finding right. that you've made about cause and effect. Okay, so the question is, do we have such data, personal monitors versus ambient measurements? Yeah, yeah. so you're going to talk about that, right? Um, no, I, I talked a little bit on uh, the webinar um, 
I talked about ozone exposures. And yes, there, there are studies that have looked at personal exposures mm -hmm. to ozone versus ambient monitor exposures, and there's very little correlation. And there's certainly been studies on measurement error and how that impacts study results. And I mentioned yeah. earlier this uh, Lawrence Romberg 2011 study looking well, at the impacts. When you say there's little correlation, what does that mean? It means Please. that the concentrations measured at ambient monitors don't have anything to do with personal exposures, that they're generally much, much higher um, than, than the personal exposures. So, so personal they're exposures. statistically different. They're, they're <clears throat> statistically different. Okay, but that's the, that is the question. Have we measured the difference, and can we use the difference in somehow interpreting the results of the, of the epidemiology ecological studies? Yeah, so somebody applied that kind of sensitivity <laughs> analysis to the sort of meta-analyses that people put up on the board right. and say, you know what, if you actually overlay a sensitivity analysis based on the wild discrepancy between personal and ambient exposures, okay. these, these effects go away. I think the, the answer to that is we have the data and no one's done the analysis. That brings up a, another point that was made yesterday about Avogadro's number and, you know, the number of molecules a, a cell can detoxify. Sounds like it's a really interesting idea but we need to kind of go home and do the analysis. Am I stating that correctly? Can yes. I, can I add a follow-up? Yes, up? please. <clears throat> uh, we can. We have the methods to do that, and we probably have the data to do that. It hasn't been done, to my knowledge. That's what I think should be done. Uh, if I was a policymaker, that's what I would want to be done, especially about on exposure measurement error, which is the 800-pound gorilla of epidemiologic bias. Um, so remember that the, uh, the confidence intervals, uh, if all the assumptions are in their calculations are met, which they aren't in this situation, but if we pretend that they are, they capture only random error. Mm -hmm. And now you're, um, now you're asking me how much uncertainty on top of that should I have because of the uncertainty and how accurate my, um, my monitoring exposures are uh, in terms of personal. And so that can only inflate those intervals. So that would be, those would be larger, wider. Okay, we're going to move on. Quick comment. It, yes, it seems please. like it fits. Uh, Dr. Arden Pope is a very uh, smart, smart person. And in 1994, I think I asked him what he felt the most important issue was. And he said to have accurate portable monitors that people could wear so that he, as an epidemiologist, knew what they were exposed to. Okay. We're going to move on. Uh, we have one presentation. We have less than an hour to make it, and we have one question. So, Dr. Goodman, you have the floor and a challenge. So. I accept. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I do, I do want to mention, I haven't, I obviously didn't read the Smith study during the break, but I, I did want to mention it's not equal from 0 to 10 and 40 to 50 because it's not on a linear scale, it's on a log scale, so it's proportional, not equal. I just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> All right, so integrating evidence. EPA's process for integrating evidence, EPA has this um, framework, and um, in theory it's good, but it's not... There's a lot of places where there isn't sufficient detail. Um, it involves doing a literature search, de selecting studies to evaluate, looking at general limitations of these studies, using what they call the modified Bradford Hill aspects, and I'll get into that on the next slide, to aid in judging causality, and then looking at evidence from major health endpoints, integrating evidence from different realms, like toxin, epi, controlled exposure, um, weighing alternative views on controversial issues, so that's in the list, but I, I don't really see it being done um, consistently throughout the, the evaluation. Um, then looking at the strength of evidence and coming to a causal conclusion, being causal, likely causal, suggestive, and then after determining causality, determining whether or not the effects are adverse. So, so this is the, the steps put forth by EPA. And I'm not going to go through all the, the Bradford Hill criteria. Basically, the two main things uh, EPA talks about when they talk about their, their way of integrating data are the Bradford Hill aspects, as EPA calls them, and then this IOM framework. So this is not a checklist. The idea is, is if you observe these 
these things, if you observe strong associations, consistent associations, it's more likely that what you're seeing is a causal association. And if you don't see these things, it's less likely that it's causal. So it's basically things to keep in mind as you look at the evidence to help you judge whether or not there's causality. And, and it's important. The idea is what Bradford Hill said after he had his list of, of criteria, is there any other way of explaining the set of facts before us? Is there any other answer equally or more likely than cause and effect? So is confounding more likely? Is bias more likely? That's the idea. That's what needs to be done. Um, and um, it's, I don't think it's, so this is one place where I think we differ, where what EPA and, and KSAC does versus what we do. They sort of say, do these data support an association? They don't say, well, is it more likely that these data support a lack of association? Um, and then I mentioned the IOM framework, and we talked about this earlier when we defined equipoise. But the idea is IOM had, Institute of Medicine had four categories and EPA has five. And yes, it's true, you could, EPA made the definition and they, they can define things however they want. It is my interpretation and, and many other people too that what EPA determines is suggestive or calls suggestive we think is still inadequate because it's not enough to put you over the edge of saying it's, it's more likely than not and really suggestive and inadequate should be collapsed together. Um, I showed this earlier this morning about EPA's causal determination, so I won't go through it again. Um, but I just want to mention the, the NACS framework for causal determinations is one of many. Um, my colleagues and I, including Mike Honeycutt, uh, participated in a workshop a few years ago now. And what we did was we looked at 50 frameworks to kind of get an idea of what are the things that all these frameworks look at, in, including the NACS framework, to get an idea of what are our best practices. And then what we did is tried to say, okay, well, the next framework is good and it has a good foundation, but are there ways that the framework could be improved? And then we published a second paper looking at that. Um, and basically what we found is that the frameworks are, you know, have similarities and differences. Part of them has to do with the causal question. What are you, what are you asking? Are, are you trying to develop a reference concentration? Are you trying to decide if something's a carcinogen or not? Are you trying to decide, um, you know, just, just causation in general. So you need to determine your causal question before you can go any further, because that's gonna help you figure out your literature search strategy, what studies to include, exclude, et cetera. And you need to basically um, get your studies in a systematic way to make sure that you, you cover the literature and you don't have a biased selection of studies. The next thing you need to do is develop and ap apply criteria to look at individual studies. So this is getting at you need to determine study quality. What's a higher quality study? What's a lower quality study? What's the, you know, is there a point where it's just, we can't take anything from the study because it's fatally flawed or, you know, this study has enough strengths that these few limitations, we're not worried about it sending it, it over. Those kind of things and the idea is you really, um, you weight studies that are of higher quality, higher than, than lower quality studies when you're doing your ultimate analysis. And, and we have found, because we've done this now, um, several times for different uh, pollutants and, and endpoints that you can't just develop one set of criteria and use it for every study you do moving forward because it really depends on the causal question you're asking and, and the endpoint you're looking at. Um, and I'll get into that in a bit. So the next step is you're integrating evidence and evaluating the evidence across studies, across realms, epi talks. How does it all fit together? What story does it tell together? Considering positive, negative, and really focusing on you, you put the most weight you base the weight you place on um, studies based on their methods, not on results. So you don't focus on the positive results, you focus on the studies that have the best methods. And if those studies show null results, then it's more likely there's a null association. Um, and then finally, you draw conclusions based on all the inferences. So um, briefly, oh, I have the title, because um, I had an example before in short-term ozone and asthma, but the idea is we came up with a causal question, the literature search strategy, we came up with study selection criteria, and then identified studies. And then when you, so this was an example of, these were factors we chose for, for evaluating study quality. And so, and I think actually kind of demonstrate, you know, like for example, we looked for adjustment for pollen, for air pollution, looking at multiple lag times is very important. You know, if you're looking at something different, those, those aspects not, might, might not matter. But basically, you know, based on, on other frameworks, we didn't make this list up, it's, it's based on, you know, looking at other things out there. We came up with a list of things that we um, thought were most important for determining study quality and basically came up with a, it's like a, a plus minus scheme if it was, if it was, um, uh, I'm just trying to think of an example. 
if if we think that all confounders were appropriately accounted for, it got a plus. If we think that not all confounders weren't uh, were appropriately confounded for, it got a minus. And then we added them up as a very crude measurement. This wasn't meant to be a quantitative analysis, but to see is there more positives than negatives or more negatives than positives. So you could just get a sense of, of kind of what's out there. And then when you looked at results, you didn't just say, are you tier one or tier two? You actually looked, you know, look at each study and, and at all the, the methods and the strengths and limitations and how that bears on interpretation of results. Um, and then integrating evidence I have here, these are mostly the Bradford Hill criteria, but the idea is, is when you integrate evidence, you look at all these factors like uh, exposure response, the strength of association, consistency and coherence, and those kind of things. And, and those are all the things you consider when you, when you integrate evidence. So when Mike asked if you have 100 studies, as long as it's more than 50, no. <laughs> because it's really, it's weighted by the quality of studies. And you know, if you have three good, really high quality studies and 97 questionably low quality studies, those three have to really form the basis of your opinion, or, or should have more weight as you form your opinion. Um, and then finally, you draw conclusions by taking all of the, the evidence from the different realms of evidence together. And I think that's, yes, that's it. So that's sort of a brief introduction to integrating evidence. Okay, clarifying questions from our panel members. <clears throat> I had one in particular. So you've done this for ozone and the ozone epidemiology data. You've um, done this the study quality evaluation and integrating evidence? Yeah, we've done it for a few. So we've published on short-term ozone and cardiovascular effects, <coughs> long-term ozone and cardiovascular effects. Um, and then we did another study looking at uh, biomarkers of systemic effects. And we're now currently, where this list came from, looking at ozone and asthma exacerbation. And so, so. where are you in, in that evaluation of the respiratory effects? Um, we have drafted a manuscript, but it's we still have a, a little ways to go before we can, we're going to submit it. It'll be soon, though. Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> Stay tuned, yes. Uh, I have just have a comment, and uh, Julie and I have talked about this before. So it's no surprise to her. Um, yeah, I agree. You wait on the quality of, uh, of the methods. The question becomes, how do you determine what's the higher quality study? And so um, that's a question that actually that I've been thinking about for the last many, many years. And uh, it turns out that there, it's, there's a complicated relationship between what goes right and what goes wrong in a study and the quality of the study. In other words, how much bias there might be in that study. And so uh, one improvement that I would suggest in the, um, is in determining the quality of the study is to do it quantitatively. And I outlined a, a way to do this in a 2008 paper that I published. Um, and and, in, and in, um, in doing that for studies, I, I realized, yes, I, my intuition for once was right, that the, uh, probably the only time it was right, actually, um, that the quality of study really is a complicated function of what goes on in a study. And it's really hard to, to make that judgment without doing the calculations. Okay, other clarifying questions? Uh, I guess I want to go back to my question. You have looked at US EPA, so you are in the process of doing, you've published some studies that are more cardiovascular, short-term, long-term, mm -hmm. which is fine because we have this, this great HEI study coming up that was going to really help inform that decision and probably give you a chance to look at, relook at those publications. And you're doing something on asthma, which is great, but I guess my question to you is, have you looked at EPA's evaluation? We, we saw some of this before, and given them some thoughts on how they could, what they did right, what they could improve, what they got maybe wrong. I mean, you've had that opportunity to share some thoughts with them? Yeah, so um, Gradient um, wrote some comments that were included in APIs comments to EPA, and we also wrote some independent comments that were funded by a, um, a, a group of industry trade organizations that we submitted to EPA. And they have our critiques of, of um, their evaluation of, of the studies. But that's a little different than this, which was an independent. I mean, the goal of this was not to critique EPA. The goal of this was to conduct a completely independent analysis the way that we thought it should be done. Okay. 
Sure. Dr. Arbrock, on the it, clarifying question would be helpful. So in the work that you are sort of in the process of doing, Julie, how did you uh, determine the quality of the studies that George was talking about? I can show, can you pull up the study, it's the Goodman Biomarkers <coughs> paper? Um, it, sorry, I can, let me find it here and then I can tell you what sort the file is called. a big blue metaphor. Um, it's called Goodman et al. Biomarkers. We're going to go to a particular, yeah, the yeah. abstract or a table? Yeah, I'm just going to show a table. Okay. Well, and while she's loading it, I can tell you, what we did is we sat down and determined what, what factors do we think contribute to, to study quality. And we, it was, we did it separately for epi, controlled exposure, and uh, animal tox studies. And when you and say then, biomarkers, biomarkers of what? Oh, Respiratory disease or? No, it was, it's basically a systematic effect. So that would be most likely cardiovascular disease. Systemic effects. Yeah, systemic. Did I say systematic? Sorry. <laughs> systematic review, systemic effects. <laughs> OK. Um, well, I can, while well, she's pulling it up. So we have, you know, study design, whether it was longitudinal, cross-sectional. So longitudinal w was a plus, cross-sectional was a minus. Um, we looked at whether, how likely we thought selection bias was. Um, let me, um, you know, we thought it was possible when recruitment was from a single university, less likely if it was from a broader group. <coughs> study size, um, exposure measurement, whether it was from, you know, less than 10 kilometer versus more than, you know, or less than one kilometer, those kind of factors, whether there was a QAQC protocol. I mean, I don't have to read them all, I guess, but you're, right. you're getting the sense. It's just sort of all these factors and methods and whether right. they get a plus or a minus for those. Okay, so, but so did you have a number, uh, sort of how did you go about calibrating that? Did, or did a number of you do that so that you were sort of using, uh, interpreting a, a good selection, treatment of selection bias or not the same way? Yeah, so that, that's exactly kind of the point that we, uh, and others can, can weigh in. What I think it's most important that you do it systematically that you, as long as you're doing it the same way for everything, so you're not biased because you're doing it different for different studies. So everybody sat down and determined what made a high quality aspect versus a low quality aspect. And then we had two people look at each study independently, and if they came to a different conclusion, then they sat down together, and if they couldn't agree, we brought in a third person. But the idea was, hopefully, because we had these laid out, every study was looked at in the same way. And also, if, if, you, if you're reading my paper and disagree, and you think, well, I think that that doesn't matter, that doesn't really impact the interpretation of results. I mean, y you can then do the exercise yourself. It's totally transparent. I think that's a key issue. It's absolutely transparent what we did. So if you disagree with it, you can say, well, wait, I'm going to shift these studies. And I think this is higher low quality. And then look at the results of those that study. OK, Mr. Kanas. Yes. Um, I mean, this is, this is fascinating. And it's uh, um, the, the methodology you've laid out. but. Uh, Frankly, it's a little opaque for me right now trying to relate it to the, uh, the issue at hand. Um, if you could illuminate you know, a little bit more how, you, you, when you conducted your methodology, it uh, would lead to differences in how KSAC or EPA uh, evaluated the you know, quality of studies and then the use of the studies and what they conducted. I mean, that's, that's what I'm, I'm just, this looks right. like a, a very thorough and useful way to go as you presented it. Uh, I just, I'm trying to figure it out with respect to how EPA uh, measured quality studies and relied on those studies. Well, what, I, what ended up happening is that, I mean, and I'm sure many different people contributed to that document, so with their own thoughts on what's high and low quality. and you'd see that something was brought up as a limitation in one study. And then so EPA would sort of downplay the results because they said it was a limitation. And then that same factor would occur in another study and it, it wasn't even mentioned. And that happens over and over in the ISA. And so that's, that's the difference. By sitting down and making sure we did it exactly the same for every study, you end up with a much more transparent and consistent 
analysis. So, okay, so now I'm picking up. So a critical issue here is that it wasn't done systematically, consistently, the way you, you, you would apply it. Right. I think there was certainly an attempt to do that. And, you know, there were many things brought up in several instances. But if you actually look, you, you can see instances where things were downplayed or upplayed in different places, you know, not mentioned here, but mentioned over there. Okay, can we go back to, oh, you have a question, Dr. Yutel, now I'm going to well, direct, uh, go ahead. It's, it's a question and, and, and a comment. Um, so having this sort of standardized, standardized methodology for evaluating the studies um, is really a, a, an important step forward. Um, it, it, it still, um, or, or it allows you to understand why if you don't do that, you can kind of select the positives that you might like in, in a study because you haven't kind of looked at the balance of, across different studies. The, the one concern I have uh, in, in this approach, and although you say the reviewer is free to disagree, mm -hmm. um, it, they may not have the tools, but um, s some of the if all of these are weighted the same as plus minus, I'm assuming that's or you gave us some score or something. Right. Like, yeah. yeah. Can you just go to page 102 of that document? Sure. So we can. You know. Then, oh yes. It's we're for not critical reviews and talk, so it's <coughs> dissertation. By, uh, so we're gonna go to page 102 and blow it up tremendously. Is it, can you rotate it too? Oh goodness. Wait. It, it, we can't no, see it. No, you're going to go down. Go down. And it was sideways, too. So you, that, that's the one. I don't know if you could rotate it. It, it won't <laughs> matter if you rotate it. <laughs> but you can tell us what Sorry. it says. Well, yeah. it's just on the, on the top. So this is for epi studies. I, I was actually reading it before. Um, it, and the top has the characteristics. So study design, selection bias, um, study size, exposure measurement, outcome assessment, statistical analysis, like model type. Was it multi-pollutant? What, Confounders adjusted for demographic, lifestyle, temporal, meteorological, other. Did it look at multiple lags? Did it conduct sensitivity analyses? So, and then, you know, each row is a study, and then you can go across to see. And I totally agree with Mark, and, and I bet George has an issue with this too. It's, yeah, everything got like a plus or a minus. We have a, a one or a minus one, but it's essentially a plus or a minus. And how can you say, is, is, is confounding more important than the exposure measurement error? Like. It, yeah. I don't know that there's an answer to that. So, sure. But the idea is, is at least this way it's laid out and you can get a sense. You can look down a column to see overall, it looks like studies did a good job adjusting for demographic and lifestyle <coughs> factors. Um, but, you know, when it comes to multi-pollutant models, um, not so much. You know, most of them didn't have multi-pollutant models. So you can get a sense of the, the totality of the literature from <coughs> the down columns and then you can look across a row for each study to see what, you know, how, how good a quality it was. So it's a, it's a good, I think, I don't know, I'm a table person, other people are text people, but, <laughs> or figure people. Um, I think it's, it's a way to at least visually see everything in one I, I just, place. I just urge you to be careful when you do this to identify, quote, good studies and bad studies. I mean, you can sort of score them, but if, if more minuses get you a bad study, um, and and all of these are weighted equally. I, I think, um, you, you, you know, you, you create some uncertainty, if you like, in your your analytical approach, uh, b because there are some of these. For example, in a controlled study, if they're not blinded, right? I think that's a very important weakness. Okay, Absolutely. very different than quote they didn't. The inclusion exclusion criteria. I mean, uh, they're probably listed, but what the important criteria are, I'm assuming you don't really have. You just say, do they list them or not? And so you, you just need to be careful in terms of how you report that as being a bad study or good study, if that becomes how you rank them, because yeah. um, um, your, your system will lose its relevance by people arguing whether it's a good or bad study. Okay. Well, I think the key, though, I just want to m mention is, and, and maybe I should just take away the, the scores, because that seems people seem to be hung up on that. It, it's more that we look at these factors and then evaluate them qualitatively. So we're, we're not, 
the, the, the pluses and minuses are just to get a sense. Is it, oh, is it more overall negative or more overall positive? But in the end, it is, we go study by study and say, based on all of these factors, do we think these results are reliable or not? Okay, Dr. Maldonado. Maldonado, George. George. <laughs> <laughs> what Dr. Goodman has done here is, is to try to solve an incredibly difficult problem mm -hmm. and try to do it in a systematic and transparent way. Um, and so I, I, I like this a lot. Yeah, I like it for, uh, I, I think you've hit the major uh, study criteria qualities. It's transparent, which is really, really nice. It's, it's, uh, transparency is something that we need, we need a lot more of in science, and we have a, very little of it, I think, in at least the risk right. assessment stuff that I've read. So this is all great. Um, I know. <laughs> so done a good, you've done a good job with something really, really complicated, uh, difficult, and certainly a step uh, beyond what I've seen done before. Now, can we improve it? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay, yeah, we can. But uh, let's not take away from, and I certainly don't want to take away from uh, a, a job really well done. Mm -hmm. um, and I, thank you very much. <laughs> and I do, I feel like with every paper it gets better and better. I almost don't want to show people the first papers because we think we keep improving. Okay. But is it okay if I just, because I think there's another important point on page 112, which is actually a smaller table, so. You're going to have to, again, see. explain this to us. Oh, I will. Yeah. So, but just, this is a way of laying out results. Um, yeah, and you'll have to rotate it back. Yeah. But basically, the idea is here, and this was when we all went back and forth if we should do arrows or numbers and bold versus not bold. And, and the one thing is this table doesn't, there's no indication of study quality in this table. But what I feel happens, and like this is what happens in the ISA too. So. You know, EPA is talking about systemic biomarkers and saying, oh, all these studies are showing impacts. This study shows this one goes up, and this study shows that one goes up. And then you read it, and it sounds like there's really something happening. So what we did is we laid them all out um, in, in a table. So these are all the biomarkers of oxidative stress in the studies we looked at. So each column is, is a biomarker. 2,3-DHBA, we have 8-oxo-20. Um, and then the second column says what, what direction is adverse. So is an increase adverse or a decrease? And then what we did, because the idea is, as we've talked about, statistical significance isn't the be-all, end-all. We just put the direction of effect as, um, as an arrow. So you could see, is, are the directions consistent? And then if it was statistically significant, we made it bold. And what we decided to do, because obviously you can't put everything from every study in here, we decided we pick the highest dose, because if there was an effect, you should see it at the highest dose. And so I think EPA <coughs> needs to do something like this. I, you can't, you can't just say, oh, these studies are showing up and down, so there's an impact on syste systemic effects. You need to say, here are all the things that should be related, and if one thing goes up, this thing should go up too, or if this goes up, this should go down, and is that what you're seeing? And are you seeing it consistently for a specific marker, and then are you seeing coherence across markers? So that's another thing that I think would help improve the, the process if EPA laid things out in this manner. Okay, so again, the, the underlying presumption is EPA didn't do it this particular way and so therefore some of their conclusions might be different if they had done it this yes. suggested way. And again, not perfect. I think it can be improved on, and well. we still haven't figured out how to get study <clears throat> quality into this kind of table, but at least it's laying out. Kay. But I do, they, in the Knox ISA, EPA has talked about some of these study quality factors. So I do have a feeling EPA is moving in this direction. I just think it wasn't done for ozone. Okay, can we go back to your presentation, slide four? Just one, one. Yep. Sure. Uh, yeah. Did the National Academy also make this suggestion with respect to formaldehyde? That yes, they oh, this is totally consistent with that. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And 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 a lot of this came about because of that. And I, can I just say it's this is not easy to do. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a very difficult and and as Julie said, you know, as we do each additional piece of work, we try to improve on the process. <clears throat> Yeah, and it's the idea is you, you actually are trying to make subjective decisions objective. I mean, that's, I think that's what's happening. One more, if you don't mind. That slide? Is that the one you no, want? I'm sorry. Let's go back to the IO. I think it's slide four. I must have missed it. No, go back. I'm sorry. Yeah, that one, right? <clears throat> yes, that's okay. it. Okay, so a clarifying question, then we'll get into our discussion, Dr. Goodman. If EPA had 
combine the suggestive and inadequate categories as you're suggesting, how would that have changed? I mean, it would look more like the IOM framework, but how would that have changed their evaluation in your, in your opinion or your thinking? Um, well, for one, wait, wrong way. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> there we go. For one, all cause mortality and cardiovascular effects would not be suggestive. They would, they would be inadequate still. So essentially, I think if EPA's framework were more like IOM's, it would knock some of the, 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 the studies characterized as suggestive into the inadequate category. All right, so for both short term and long term, or? Yeah, you, no, just, um, just long term, sorry. So instead, of, okay. There would be little to no evidence or no conclusion. And I also, I, you know, as I said, the, the definition for likely causal is that, um, and actually I think I have it here somewhere, don't I? Let me find it. Uh, uh oh. She, she opened up the wrong. Yeah, yeah, I think you opened up the wrong slide set. Because I had, uh, the slide set I was using before had extra slides, and this one doesn't. Um, I can I have the definition here. Okay. Sorry, um, just give me one second. Well, I think you answered my question. That's, that's fine. Okay, well, I was just going to say, so I think some <clears throat> of the likelies would go down to okay. you know, below equipoise as well. So let's talk about, we have question eight. How do we integrate all realms of evidence? How can and should uncertainty be presented to adequately inform risk assessors and decision makers? <coughs> Any thoughts, gentlemen, on this? Yes, George. Well, I think that's what we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Goodman has laid out a framework for integrating, uh, one that's qualitative. Can it be improved to be quantitative assessment to come to a quantitative assessment of study quality? Yeah, we can do that. It's a lot of work to do it qualitatively. It's even more work to do it quantitatively. <laughs> right. Uh, so much so that it, it uh, in many situations, it might be, well, I, I think I would need my $600,000. I might need one of another $1,000, $100,000 from you, Julie, to do this, to do it quantitatively. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work to instead of. It was uh, millions, by the way. Oh, millions, yeah, you're I right. I'm sorry. Plenty of money. I, I've got plenty of money, yeah. yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Sorry. For each of the uh, each of the plus minuses, I can uh, it, it is possible to put a probability distribution around the uh, magnitude of error caused by that problem, and then we can integrate all of that together in a complicated Monte Carlo way, mm -hmm. which I think risk risk assessors are familiar with. We're yeah, more Monte Carlo. Familiar. Yeah, yeah, and that that works. So we could do that, but that's that is a lot a lot of work. Okay, other thoughts? Yes, Dr. Fairman? Yeah, I, I think you, to improve the process, I think you charge KSAC with that specific duty to say, what do you see in the process that needs improvement? And I think your evaluation method would come up. But you also expand KSAC so that it has a broader representation and it uh, has representation from people like at this table uh, that obviously have studied the problem far, far more than someone who's on KSAC whose study is supported uh, by EPA and might, they might be reluctant to say, you know, I don't like your selection criteria. So I think a broader representation and uh, I think it would include people from uh, American Petroleum Institute and, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, especially people that are affected, the people who have to try to make their community work, who try to, uh, as we heard on, on day one, try to make Central California survive and so on. And these people have a stake, and you back there have a stake as well. So I think that uh, getting more stakeholders to give suggestions and recommendations and critiques uh, would really help the process. Okay, good. Other thoughts, Mark? So, I'm going to look at this question just a little differently. Sure. Um, because as I look at 
how do we integrate the evidence? The question is, how do we come to conclusions between what we think is the exposure and what we think is the health outcome? And I think what you have proposed, uh, Dr. Goodman, in terms of looking at study quality and having consistent guidelines should be very helpful in terms of if you come up with, I guess you use tier one and tier two, and I'm assuming tier one is better than tier two. Yeah, we two. just did it. Yeah. More positives and negatives is tier one. So you have those studies that are stronger, and presumably uh, they, they show an effect, although they, they might mm -hmm. not. That gives the committee and, and the EPA the chance to look at what are the higher quality studies. Integrating the health effects to me is more complicated um, because I'm not sure how you go from a change in lung function to mortality. Uh, and, and so the integration is really a series of different questions. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to necessarily come up from, from the animal study or the clinical study with a mechanism for an effect that's shown in the, in the EPI study. I mean, that's great integration if you can actually do it. Um, that's, that's ideal. We, we, we come across all these disciplines. But what it does do, I think, is giving you gives you more confidence in the strength of the study related to, to, to the finding and so I'm not sure that I would call it um, integrating the evidence but it certainly is identifying the stronger evidence using better criteria uh, to, to pin down are there health effects or, or not because at the end of the day I think the question is you know what it, what do the studies show about adverse health effects. And this is a way of, of trying to at least qualitatively and to some degree quantitatively putting them um, in, in some order in terms of the, the strength of the association. So uh, it does seem to me that looking at strengths of studies is a, a very important step forward. Other thoughts from our panel? Yes, Barry. Now, I'd just like to address the <clears throat> second part of this, which says, uh, and I'll read it, uh, how can and should uncertainty be presented to adequately inform risk assessors and decision makers? I mean, that's an incredibly complex problem, ranging all the way across from, you know, animal studies, chamber studies, uh, uh, uncertainties and ex exposures, uh, 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 measurement error, I mean, it's, it's a it's not a hopeless process, but it's a very difficult one. Um, and I'm not sure the policy uh, individuals are going to be able to pick up on every one of these steps and say, oh, that uncertainty is less important than this uncertainty over here. Um, I, I don't have a good way of doing this. I'm, I'm not sure there is a good way of doing this. I mean, we could forge ahead and suggest some, <clears throat> some of these things that uh, uh, Dr. Maldonado uh, uh, presented where we put together some kind of Monte Carlo approach. I suppose that's the best way because it will give us some idea of what the distribution of that is. What I'm afraid will happen is the distribution will become wide and flat and you know, we won't be able to supply much information at all to the policymakers if we do this. Right. So an integrating framework that others use, EPA as well, is this mode of action framework where you put various key events mm -hmm. in sequence. And so, of course, one of the, and the apical effects, the clinical effects, mortality would be over here somewhere on the sequence. And you'd have some initial key events like, you know, ozone exposure and uptake in the, in the superficial water layer. And then you can go through that. Would that help to put these key events together in a sequence that makes sense? I mean, we talked about this sort of a roundabout, but we haven't really connected the, the mortality with the, uh, the FEV1 decrements, it seems somehow they're related. I mean, biologically, you might think that. So is that possible to put that sequence together or no? It seems to me that that's fairly far removed from mortality. I mean, it's associated with it. But what I'm concerned about is we have another series of these that might be associated with exposure. We have another series of these things that might be associated with some relationship between other contaminants, co-contaminants at the same time. It, it, it becomes a morass that we could all get stuck in. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, other thoughts? Yes? Just, going, uh, just commenting on your uh, comment about the uh, Monte Carlo. Uh, uh, doing a, a probabilistic or Monte Carlo bias analysis, considering all important study problems, is not necessarily going to give you uh, a relative risk par probability distribution that's wide and flat. I'm just suggesting that it might. Well, yeah, it might. Okay. It, but let's not let's not judge it on it. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's not throw it away because, in that situation, if if the final probability distribution for the relative risk of X on Y was wide and flat, that would tell the policymaker that there's so much uncertainty in this study that it's really not very helpful to me at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which you wouldn't see if you didn't do the bias analysis and you looked only at the confidence interval which which would take into account only the random error so whatever you get it'll be useful now it's be very discouraging to epidemiologists to see that their study results are <laughs> wide and flat <laughs> then let's let's uh, let's get more information you tighten that up by getting more information about how uh, the magnitude of the problems that actually occurred in your study how much measurement error was that uh, was in your study measure it? You know, um, how much selection <coughs> bias did you have? What can you tell me about confounding variables that you were not able to measure well, uh, and what their impact might be on, on the study results? Okay. Other thoughts or comments from panel members? Any clarifying questions from on this particular? It's a complex question. <coughs> We have several things here. We have this idea of the analysis is good with you and your colleagues. A good start uh, would be helpful. Integrating all of the information is, of course, more complex than just evaluating study quality. Um, maybe this idea of charging KSAC, which was mentioned, I'd be maybe one or several of you gentlemen, to improve this and then give them more representation. That's a really good idea. I mean, I can see KSAC seven core members kick it up to maybe 15 and really give this a thorough vetting. Um, EPA's analysis, uh, Dr. Goodman went back, how far, when did they actually start this analysis? Is this five years ago, two years ago? Um, I want to say 2008. Is that, I mean, that's when the last one came out. That's when the reconsideration happened. All right, so their analysis that they have in their ISA is back to 2008. That's where they started this? I believe so. there was a reconsideration in between there, so. Was it, can someone else correct me if I'm wrong? Was it 2008? Yeah. Well, the I know reconsideration? Right. But the, right, but the last, the last cycle yeah. was 2008. Right, so then that, yeah. yeah, so the ISA for that cycle came out. Well, I guess Earlier the the question is, we do so have some. I think the date started in 2006. All right, so 2006. Then. We well, we do have some colleagues from US EPA and others on the webinar. Maybe they can send us a little note via the web about when that started. The point being, this is newer information. This idea of the National Academy of Sciences formaldehyde statement that Mr. Kanasu raised uh, was was after this ISA reevaluation, perhaps. So it might be instructive uh, to our EPA colleagues to reconsider this, some of this evaluation of epidemiology data with this new thinking. Mike, can I ask? Sure. I something. So I was thinking about when you were talking about if we could make up, uh, make up, if we could draw out starting with mode of action and, and, and work over that, like to simple, uh, things like FEV1 right. and, and work our way up to mortality and that that can be difficult because of dose and, and exposure and that sort of thing. But if we look at kind of a big picture comparison of what we see in the mode of action and the clinical to what we see in the epi, question, the big picture questions like thresholds. Would we expect to see a threshold in the epi? Or we, if, if these people are even getting the dose that, that maybe they would be if they were outside all the time and we knew that they were getting exposed to ambient concentrations, would we expect mortality at the same doses as we see FEV1? It just, it doesn't seem like there's a, 
a necessarily a connection between what we see in the clinical studies and <coughs> the epi studies if you consider dose and threshold. And I was wondering if anybody can speak to that. Well, well, I mean, the organizing principle that I suggested is something that EPA and other groups are doing right now, is it's a mode of action framework. I mean, if you look at EPA's guidelines mm -hmm. for cancer in 2005, they emphasize understand mode of action before you do any kind of extrapolation. I mean, that's the whole point of their, their guidelines. It's very good that way. And understanding mode of actions is key event fr at the framework, so putting it all together. It may be difficult to do, and there may be disconnection, but that's one organizing way you can approach it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that makes sense to try if it hasn't already been done. I, I mean, at the end of the day, you, you've got the modes of action that were identified uh, early on yesterday, I think you talked about four or five mechanisms. Um, that's what you're going to use to get to get there, and you can try and develop a scenario that gets you from that exposure to the outcome, be, because that's our understanding of how ozone would have any any effect, whether it's a short term or, or, or longer term effect, but. You know, the steps in between and the uncertainty, as I would look at it, are, are indeed quite quite substantial, especially when you're getting to a question of mortality. Um, you know, um, in, it, it's hard to know if, if ozone exposure is contributing to, to mortality clinically versus statistically, okay? And so I would be, I would be very careful in, about drawing uh, the mode of, act of, of action kind of diagram, if you like, um, to, to, to get to that. I would have less confidence in my work than I usually do. So it, uh, it's, um, uh, it, it, you know, it, the, the, the reality on mortality is that this is statistical. Uh, and does it go beyond that? I don't is know. Is it biological? Yeah. yeah. So you would, I mean, you could put your sequence together, and an anapical effect might be mortality, but that would be high, that would be more uncertain than something else. For sure. Okay. Other thoughts or comments from panel members? Are we talking about premature mortality, or what, what, when we talk about mortality, are we talking about an exposure response <coughs> lag of 24 hours? Or yeah, so you have, Mr. Yeah, you have to be. Yeah, I, I'm seeking for clarification on mortality as an endpoint. Are we talking about whether ozone potentially could cause mortality in a short term exposure, what EPA calls premature mortality, or are we talking about shortening of life from 75 years to 74.5? So I, so I brought this up as, as a possible apical outcome. I'm not necessarily, I mean, just tying to the observed literature for ozone. I mean, you can get mortality from short-term exposures to ozone if it's high enough. Well, we all but know that. It, it, it speaks, it's relevant when we talk about mode of action. The mode of action is going to be completely different or the potential mode of action will be different if we're talking about short-term responses. Yeah, I, I was just raising that as a possible integrating way of tying the data to de together. Yeah, and I, I like that. I just looking for, it, this is a question I'm trying <clears throat> to ask is which mortality or Dr. you tell which mortality would you be thinking of? Um, well, I'm not really thinking of either, but um, I, I mean, I've questioned it from, from, from the beginning, but it, as I look at what the studies show it really is um, looking at deaths that occur uh, related to ozone concentrations. I mean, that's that, that's sort of where the, the data come from. And I would look at that as contributing to mortality rather than as the cause of, of mortality. But, um, you know, as, as I say, it's really a statistical relationship, uh, not, not necessarily a, a biological one. I think the answer is short term, because you'll have a lag 
and that lag is not going to be 40 years. So I think that uh, when we look at deaths and uh, environmental data, it's almost it's short term basically. Most of the data is short term, within maybe five days of, of the measured exposure, the, the measured uh, ozone right. concentration. Okay. Mr. Lorenzen. Yes, Dr. Goodman, I want to go back to your chart, your scoring of the studies in terms of, of their quality, which I think is tremendously useful. First of all, have you given that to EPA or to KSAC as a recommendation for the way they might do things in the future? Many times. Okay, excellent, <laughs> excellent. Now I want to read something to you, and I want to ask you how you respond to this. This is Mississippi versus EPA, the 2008 Ozone Next decision from the D.C. Circuit, uh, fairly recent. Uh, in setting the 2008 ozone NAAQS, EPA relied on a broad array of scientific studies, quantified models, input from KSAC, EPA staff, and commenters, and it considered not only what was known, but also what was not known. <coughs> it then evaluated the evidence as a whole through an integrative synthesis, I probably pronounced that wrong, Maldonado, what it called a, <laughs> sorry, what it called a weight of evidence approach. And appropriately so. One type of study might be useful for interpreting ambivalent results from another type. And though a new study does little besides confirm or quantify a previous <laughs> finding, such incremental and arguably duplicative studies are valuable precisely because they confirm or quantify previous findings or otherwise decrease uncertainty. It goes on and on. But the question is, once you've scored your studies this way, tremendously useful. What do you do with them? Do you discard them if they're too low? Or does the agency get to, as the court suggested here, look at one type of study as a way of, say, offsetting the uncertainties that you found in the other study? Weight of evidence. How does this work? So the idea is if you have all low quality studies, it's basically meaningless. And I actually, I've what I, I get the feeling, the idea is this is the best we can do. Someone just said we spent $15 billion. We spent all this money. We've got to be able to use it, right? It's my tax money. Um, but, or some of it, I assume. <laughs> but, um, no, but the idea is if, if this is the best we can do, we need to try to pull whatever we can from it. And no one's really coming right out and asking the question, but is what we can pull it from it good enough? Or do we have to say that there's just too many uncertainties and we can't say with certainty whether there's an effect? So that's part of it. And then the other part is it, if every study, the high quality and low study, assuming you have these high quality studies, produce the same results, you, you're golden, right? You, that's, the results are what they are. It's when the results are discordant. That's, you, so you, you have different results in, high, in different studies. So you say, okay, well, let's now try to tear it apart and say, what do the high quality studies say versus the low? And are the, are the high quality studies consistent? And if they are, then you could say, well, look, we know all these low quality studies have issues, so we probably should not be weighing those results. I mean, you still acknowledge them. You don't, the key thing is you don't throw out anything. You, you're a hoarder with, <laughs> with studies. You, because you have to be sure that you're considering everything. But the idea is you consider it, and then if it's, you know, studies can have fatal flaws. If it's a fatal flaw, then you say, we looked at it, here's why we're not considering it at all. If it has a, a morbid flaw, but not a fatal flaw, I don't know. You know what I mean? Th then you, you know, you Short might term get a little or more. Um, consideration, but you really, the idea is if it's discordant results, you place more weight on the high quality, results from high quality studies. Okay. And, and I, I think the, the, the agency would argue that they do that, but, but uh, what they don't, uh, I think what you provided is a systematic way of trying to decide what is that high, stu uh, high quality study and uh, l less sort of uh, general interpretation of that this is a good study for the following reason, uh, that, that it's not a checklist, but it is a way of looking at consistency across different studies. And, and that will be, or, or should be, uh, very helpful in going forward. Yeah, and as I said, I wish I had the, and I could send it to people, or you could find it online. It's Table 5.1 of the Second Draft Knox ISA. And it's basically EPA is showing that a lot of these things that I'm talking about. So. Between the first draft and the second draft, EPA didn't make tables like I did and show that they did it in a consistent manner. But <coughs> I, th I, I think that people there might actually agree with me, at least to an extent, because the fact that they added that table at all says they're, they're going in this direction. Okay, we have two other clarifying questions from the audience, and then we're going to go to question nine and give our 
uh, panel one last shot. So Dr. McClellan, you're first, and then this gentleman over here second. Well, um, as, as I think everyone knows, the uh, process by which uh, the NACs are set is a long and complex process in which there are various critical endpoints, uh, landmarks, if you will, in terms of the preparation of uh, documents by the agency <coughs> with its consultants and then review by KSAC. And let me emphasize again, KSAC, statutorily seven people, but every panel in recent years has typically had a total of 18 to 22, 23 <laughs> members. The, the uh, additional people are consultants. So that process is clearly in place. And public comments come in. These frequently are iterative in terms of each of these documents. Now we come down to the final stage, the proposed rule. And the proposed rule is the summary document that states the evidence that the administrator is going to be using in making her decision on the final rule. So what was in the first document or the revised document, quite frankly, is immaterial at this point. So my question to Julie is, does the proposed rule appropriately state the evidence in terms of the effects of ozone so that the administrator can make an informed policy judgment on the indicator, the averaging time, the level, and the statistical form. If not, what is inadequate in the proposed rule? Um, I've got about 50 single space pages <laughs> that I'm, you know, where we've, we've written on issues that we, we think are, um, where, where there are issues. I think. Some of the issues come down to not representing um, the state of the science. Some, you know, we talked yesterday about the controlled exposure studies, as I said. So she has indicated that Kim and Schlegel support lowering the standard, and we think that the data from those studies weren't accurately represented. She talks about controlled exposure studies showing systemic inflammation and changes, but doesn't talk about how findings weren't statistically significant or clinically significant. So I think before I go through, the, I won't go through the list, but the idea is I don't think the studies are properly represented, but I also don't think, um, it, it, it's exactly what you're saying, you know, the, the epi studies have different averaging times, and the controlled exposure <coughs> studies have these exposure scenarios that aren't necessarily representative of what's happening in the real world, and, and those types of aspects aren't, aren't highlighted. I okay. think that's what you're getting at. So I think the answer is, no. Well, I think it'd be very useful to summarize those perhaps in one or two visuals because that's, if you want to have impact on the administrator, it's not in how many limbs are on the tree, but did you inaccurately describe the pine tree versus the deciduous tree? I think that's what becomes uh, critical. Okay. Uh, so I just offer that. The other is how has that body of evidence changed versus the body of evidence as existed when the administ previous administrator made the decision to set the standard at 75, eight hour, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so that's an excellent <clears throat> question because the idea is if the, the weight of evidence hasn't changed, that there's no support for changing the standard. And basically, you know, there have been new epidemiology. Some of them are new analyses of data that have been analyzed and published and reviewed by EPA before. So it's not actually new evidence, it's just a new way of analyzing evidence. There have also been new studies. But all of the new studies cited have the same limitations <coughs> and strengths, but of the, old, the studies that were reviewed in, in the last review process. So the idea is you have more studies, but the weight of evidence hasn't changed. Um, a, a woman brought up earlier the idea of, you know, something getting upgraded to suggestive is, well, now there's more evidence to say something's going on, I would argue, no, there isn't. There's more studies, but the studies are the same, you know, the, the same quality and same issues as before. So it's just more of the same. It's not like we've got, you know, better studies, you know, as a whole, better high quality studies that are, are pushing the weight. Okay, so, yeah. one last comment, and then we have one last question, and we're gonna break for lunch. Go ahead, sir. 
again, uh, Tim French with EMA. So I'm thinking about this notion of how do we communicate um, the uncertainties to potential <coughs> decision makers, policy makers. And if it were me, one thing you get when you look at this um, ozone document and the supporting record for it is if you print it all out, you know, all of the assessments and appendices, I don't know, what is it, four feet of material? It's, it's immense. And so for a policymaker, decision maker, there's a real problem in terms of how do I still have a good sense of what the forest here as opposed to just getting buried by all the trees. And so there are a couple things that I think if you were going to write up a summary or, or where do we go from here, you might think about. One, a policymaker needs to know what is the magnitude of the risk that we're talking about, really. Let's take a step back. From the EPI studies, what is the relative risk that we're dealing with? Assuming it's a real phenomenon, is it less than 1% that I'm going to have a mortality effect? Is it 2% that I'm going to have some sort of act exacerbation of another problem? So really put that in context so that you know a, a decision maker knows this is relatively potentially sort of a small issue. Similarly, on the, on the human study side, what is it that we're teasing out? Uh, a loss of FEV of, what'd you say, 2%, 4%, something like that. I mean, what are these impacts? And then when you, so put that in context so if somebody knows what I'm dealing with. And then after that, okay, what are the key uncertainties? For the human studies you pointed out yesterday, well, one uncertainty is whether or not you're ever going to get to that trigger exposure level given the three <coughs> components of dose. And the fact that when you consider respiration rate, ambient level, time, and you multiply all those together, you really see that for average people, they're, I don't know what it is, order of magnitude below the trigger level. I mean, that's what you went over yesterday. And so you need to articulate that. On the epi studies, you have to articulate the fact there are all kinds of uncertainties about this relative risk that's probably small to begin with. There's the exposure issues that we've talked about. There's modeling selection issues that we've talked about. Um, there are co-pollutants that we really haven't talked about, but the fact is when you throw in PM 2.5, most ozone effects disappear. So, and then you, and then at the end of the day, therefore, you have a good articulation for a policymaker. First, here are the effects. Here's their magnitude. So we put them in some sort of sane pre presentation, not just four feet of stuff. And then finally, overlay on top of that the sources of uncertainty or putting them more in relevant context in terms of dose. And I think that at the end of the day, somebody might say, why are we here? I've got, I, I need to go to lunch. This doesn't, this doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, we do need to go to lunch, but <laughs> that was a good segue. But we do have another question before we release the uh, science panel. Other issues or questions that you want to raise? So this is intended to be open-ended. Of course, it's sort of been that way all along. Are you ready? Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> Don't use the <clears throat> exclusion of <clears throat> financial costs <clears throat> to exclude <clears throat> the cost to public health of decision. Okay. Because the public has to live with every health consequence of the decision, not just the one for that isolated agent. And when I brought this up, the answer is we're excluded from considering costs. Well, I'm not talking about costs. I'm talking about health effects. And to not include relevant health effects is completely wrong, in my opinion. And then based on what Dr. McClellan showed yesterday of the health cost of poor economic <coughs> status, this feeds into your point? Well, <clears throat> if, if it's significant, <clears throat> yeah. If it's not significant, no. Okay. I and mean, there may be some agents that you have to ban because of their huge impact on human health. But let's not ban something that has a minor impact or control something that has a minor impact, direct impact on human health, but is necessary for supporting human health in a, for other reasons. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Ryan? 
I don't think I have anything to add at this point. I've made my points about uh, exposure and uh, uh, co-pollutants, which I think uh, someone just raised over here, the, the fact that uh, the ozone effect goes away if we consider PM while they're acting as surrogates for one another. Uh, there are other components of, of uh, uh, the <coughs> pollutant mix, for lack of a better term, uh, in the atmosphere that are associated with ozone. Perhaps we should keep in mind those as well. And if we think those are important, then a change in standard might be necessary. We have not had much um, research done in that area. So I'm thinking maybe there's, that's a, a place for future research. Okay. Dr. Maldonado? No more comments. No more comments. Dr. Utel? Uh, just just one, one comment, uh, largely because I've heard our chair of the panel here keep referring to this mechanism. Um, I'm not um, quite as convinced that we understand the mechanism of the range of biological responses we've talked about. I do think the uh, oxidant effect is, is very important. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not sure that the changes in lung function are strictly a consequence of overwhelming the um, the antioxidant defenses, and then we th replenish those antioxidants and we uh, minimize or reduce the, the effect. I, I'm still intrigued that there are many respiratory irritants that don't work um, strictly by uh, an oxidant effect that can cause changes in lung function. Um, and we know that uh, ozone uh, can irritate the eyes and, and, other, uh, and, and, and other organs, and uh, it can do it quickly. Uh, and it may just be an irritant effect. I, I, I want to make sure we don't walk away thinking we have now explained the mechanism of action of ozone. It may be important, but uh, to be to be proven, um, and, you know, we we need to make make sure that uh, we're, we're comfortable with the idea that it's an interesting hypothesis, but uh, not not established at this point. Right. Good. Good point.